So let's talk about why the ordinary least squares estimator of beta is such a good estimator for our regression parameters. There's actually a number of different arguments that you can make that would compel someone to think that this is a reasonable estimator. So one of those reasons is that it has a nice geometric interpretation. So specifically, if you were trying to project our response onto the space spanned by the set of regressors, then the result that you would get is in fact, in fact corresponds directly to the ordinary least squares estimator that we derived. So there's a nice geometric interpretation for why the ordinary least squares estimator is a good one. Another one is that the ordinary least squares estimator in fact matches what you would get using maximum likelihood estimation. So when you're deriving a maximum likelihood estimator, you're trying to find the estimate that results in a model that is most likely to have produced the observed data. So essentially what we ask is, what kind of data do we observe? And what are the parameter values most likely to have produced the particular data set that we observed? And if you assume that your errors are independent and identically distributed, and that they come from a normal distribution, then in fact, the least squares estimator that we derive corresponds exactly with the maximum likelihood estimator. So if you like maximum likelihood estimation, then the least squares estimator that we derive seems like a reasonable choice. However, I think probably the main reason that people really like the ordinary least squares estimator that we've derived is related to the fact that it is the best linear unbiased estimator of our regression coefficients. And the way that you prove that is using something called the Gauss-Markov theorem. So let's just talk a little bit more about what it means to be the best linear unbiased estimator here. So uh, let's work through this. So unbiased, that means that the expected value of the estimator is equal to the target parameter. So we've already shown, in fact, that our ordinary least squares estimator is unbiased. We also said, or we, that theorem also says that it is a linear estimator, which essentially means that beta hat is equivalent to A transpose Y, where A is some vector of constants. And in fact, uh, what we use is X transpose X inverse X transpose. I guess there's a transpose here just to make the matrix algebra line up. So in fact, we can represent our estimator as a linear combination of the random variable of interest. But then we say that it is the best. Okay, this is maybe the most important word in this entire thing. So what does it mean that it is the best? Well, in this particular context, it means that if beta tilde is another unbiased estimator, unbiased estimator of beta, then the variance of the estimator has to be at least as large as the variance of beta hat. So essentially, the reason that we call the linear, the ordinary least squares estimator the best is because among all unbiased estimators, it has the minimum variance, which might strike you as an odd property, but because our estimators are functions of the data, right? We have this right here. So our estimator is a function of our random variable y, or random vector y. It's going to have a distribution of its own. And if we had two estimators with distributions, so say this is beta hat, the distribution of beta hat, and then we had another one, beta tilde. They're both unbiased, which means that they're centered around the true parameter value beta there. But uh, you notice that the estimator, the distribution of beta tilde here is much more diffuse, so it's a lot more spread out than the estimator for beta hat. And what that means is that, on average, the estimates, on average, the estimates you get from beta hat should be closer to beta than on beta tilde for beta tilde. So this is not going to be true every single time. So it's not true that every single time beta hat will produce a better estimate than beta tilde. But on average, that's the case. 
So if we try to compute the probability that beta hat minus the true beta was less than or equal to epsilon, so essentially that this distance is small, for every single value of epsilon, that probability is going to be more than the corresponding probability for beta tilde. Okay, and, and I should be clear here, this epsilon here is not the normal epsilon, not related to our errors. This is just some constant that we picked, so maybe I should call this tau or something like that. So tau is some really small number, like 0.01 or something. And we want to know the probability that beta hat is close to beta and beta tilde is close to beta. And on average, beta hat is going to be closer to beta than beta tilde is going to be. And so that's a way of determining which estimator is better than the other. And so among all possible unbiased estimators anywhere, the Gauss-Markov theorem says that beta hat, in fact, has the smallest variance. So it's the best. So that's a good reason for choosing it as an estimate or as an estimator. So just to be clear here about what assumptions we need to make in order to use the Gauss-Markov theorem. So we need an estimable function. Uh, and a linear function C transpose beta is said to be estimable for every possible value of beta if and only if there exists some linear combination of our responses such that the expected value of that linear combination equals a linear function that we want to estimate. And this may seem like sort of an odd condition or maybe a difficult condition to satisfy. But in fact, as long as our X matrix has full rank, its columns are linearly independent, then all linear combinations of our regression parameters are in fact estimable. So this is actually a fairly straightforward condition to satisfy. The other conditions that we need to have uh, in order to use the Gauss-Markov theorem are that we're going to assume that our errors have a mean of zero, which we've been assuming pretty much since the beginning of this chapter. We're going to assume that the errors are uncorrelated and identically distributed, which means that the variance matrix of the errors can be represented as sigma squared times identity. We have to make the assumption, at least implicitly, that our model is in fact correct. So what this means is that we're not missing any regressors that we should be using. Uh, and we also don't have extra regressors that aren't part of the true model. And then lastly, we have some parameter psi that's estimable. And then under these conditions, the Gauss-Markov theorem says that among all possible unbiased linear estimators of the target parameter here, that the linear combination of beta hat has the minimum variance and is unique. So the uniqueness is an important detail. And what it means is that there is really only one possible best estimator. So no one else is ever going to find another estimator that is as good as the ordinary least squares estimator. Now you might be wondering, well, what happens if these assumptions are not satisfied and the Gauss-Markov theorem does not apply? Well, if those conditions are not satisfied, then it's possible that another estimator may in fact be better than the ordinary least squares estimator. So some common scenarios that people face are that the errors are correlated, for example. So correlated errors would be a situation where, for example, Let's say that we have data uh, that looks kind of like this. We fit a straight line to that. Okay, that line looks like it fits reasonably well. But then when we look at a plot of the residuals versus the fitted values, we might notice something like this. Okay, we might see this. And you can see there's a clear pattern in these residuals. So this would be an example of a situation where the errors appear to be positively correlated. Well, if the errors are positively correlated, the Gauss-Markov theorem no longer applies. And so what you really need to do is you need to take into account the fact that your errors are correlated and use that to come up with a more efficient estimator. And this has already been done. So this kind of estimator has already been created or studied. And this kind of estimation is known as generalized least squares. And I can actually just show you, but in that case, the generalized least squares estimator is x transpose v inverse x inverse times 
x transpose v inverse y, where v is equal to the covariance matrix of your errors. Okay, and so what you have to actually do is you have to account for the fact that your errors are correlated in the process of estimating your regression coefficients. So that is generalized least squares, and that's appropriate when the errors are correlated in some way, or even if the errors are uncorrelated but not identically distributed, you can use generalized least squares estimation. Another problem that people run into is that instead of having a normal-ish distribution, so the error, we often assume that the errors are normal, we may in fact see data where the errors have a long or heavy tail. And what that means is that the probability of seeing a really large or a really small response is non-negligible. So let me draw a picture of a data set of this type. So when I'm drawing pictures in general, at least so far in this class, we expect to see data that looks something like this. Okay, looks nice and well behaved. If we want to fit a line to that, it probably looks something like that. But if you have a data if you have a data coming from a distribution with a heavy tail, then it's likely that you're going to see unusually large or small responses. So let's say that we have also observed these two responses out there. Well, these are unusually large and unusually small compared to the rest of the data. But if you have long-tailed distributions, this is something that you can certainly see. And in that case, if you're going to fit a line using least squares, we might get something like that. That might be the line of best fit. You can see that's pretty different from the least squares line that we fit before. And so essentially when you have data with long tails, what you want to do is you want to actually ignore these points. And you really just want to fit the bulk of the data, the, the data that doesn't appear extreme or have outliers. And this is actually built into R. So you can do robust linear model estimation using the RLM function in the mass package. And what it does is it downweights outliers so that they don't have as much impact on the estimated regression line. So if you have heavy tail data or long tailed data, you probably want to use some sort of robust estimation technique. And lastly, the last thing we'll talk about is that it's not uncommon to see regressors that are highly correlated. So for example, if we were looking at measurements on a person, we might measure their height, their leg height, and their arm length. And you would suspect that there's probably going to be a strong correlation between those three things. Just because if a person is tall, their legs are probably going to be tall, their arms are probably going to be longer, etc. And so if we include all of those predictors into our regression model, that can actually create problems if they're, if they're very highly correlated. And so what you actually want to do is use some sort of penalized regression. And what this does is it actually constrains the estimates a little bit. It shrinks them towards zero. And one of the oldest methods of penalized regression is known as ridge regression. We're not going to talk about it in great detail, but basically it, it penalizes the size of the regression coefficients using uh, the square of each value. And another really popular one that's more recently been developed is known as lasso. And once again, in both cases, it penalizes the size of the regression parameters. And so it constrains these regression parameters to be a little bit smaller. And so if we don't want to throw away any of these correlated regressors, what this can do is it, it makes sure that none of the estimated coefficients get too large. Um, and we're also downplaying the role of this combination of correlated regressors. Because the reality is that if we have three regressors that are highly correlated, they're pretty much giving us the same information. We probably only need one of them. And so what this penalized regression does is it sort of downplays their, their overall impact so that they don't have too much impact on the overall regression model.